Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're feeling great today. And if you're nervous about something that you have to communicate, maybe there's a speech you have to give, someone you have to persuade to do something or to come on board with your idea, then today's show is going to be everything you need and more. Because we're talking about communication. How do you persuade someone? How do you communicate effectively? Um, how do you how do you handle public speaking, which is something a lot of people struggle with? And the expert on board who will take us through all of this is a familiar face. I would say at this point in time, we should, I, should, I don't even need to introduce him, but I will. His name is Derek Banga. He is a communication expert and the CEO of Public Image. Um, welcome. It's great to be back. It's great to have you, Thank Derek. It's Thank really you. just always so much fun when you yes. come on the show. So first things first, why is it even important for us to have an understanding of communication and how it impacts our relationships? Yeah, I think communication in this day and age where artificial intelligence is coming, automation, digital communication, everything is being done either online and we have sort of lost the ancient art, if you will, of being able to communicate face to face, mm. to persuade people. Because mm, we're on our phone. And that's how, you know, that's the world we live in, mm. you know, um, everything has been automated. Mm -hmm. But really, I think we were created by God to be able to look each other in the eye, mm. uh, to be able to persuade uh, people with our thoughts. Your idea is only as good as whether you can get that idea across to the other person. So whether it's convincing your partner of, of something or whether right. it is convincing your boss to give you a promotion yeah. or a raise or whether it's being able to sell your ideas in any particular forum that you right. would imagine. Yeah, like those quick, mm -hmm. quick elevator pitches right. or, you know, it really, it really does impact um, your life if you're able to quickly and directly express what you yep. mean. So before we even dive into like the, the essence of communication, what about the nonverbal cues, nonverbal ways that we might be communicating with, uh, with people? Can you give us some insight on that and how it works? Sure. So that's part of it. Nonverbal communication plays a huge role in part of this uh, idea of persuasion and uh, nonverbal communication starts with some of the obvious ones for example eye contact okay. you know being able to develop that and we talk about this and okay. particularly i talk about this for example with my clients but you'd be surprised how peop some people struggle with to look people in the yeah, eye and why would the the, why would that be difficult it for could someone? be cultural okay. it could be that person's personality how they feel about themselves yeah. it could be all sorts of things they may even be doing it and they don't even notice that they don't look people in the eye when they're speaking or that the eye contact is fleeting or okay. and it raises all sorts of red flags yeah so that would be a part of the non-verbal okay um eye about, contact yes okay. eye contact yeah a smile i mean some of these are basic you know yeah. basic thing like a smile we're yeah. instinctively born to react to a smile by the way babies smile in the womb you know that's an instinct that we all have but there's some people who I don't know, maybe they take life too seriously and they yeah. don't realize that if you want to create rapport with any audience, that's why great people on TV like yourselves or news anchors before they're reading the news will always smile. Right, because it's camera. an invitation like, hi, an invitation. you're welcome. It's a rapport. You're welcome to, right. Yeah, you've already started communicating right. to a particular audience. Right, mm -hmm. because you can imagine if I started the show like, you know, shoulder slumped and was like, hi guys, um, exactly. we're at Park Inn and... We're about to speak to Derek Banga, because that's saying everything, isn't it? Versus if I'm, my chest is out a little, oh. my shoulders are back, my head is up, I'm like, welcome. You have got it. That's yeah. right. Shoulders right. up, chin parallel to the ground. Okay. And here's an interesting thing about a lot of this nonverbal communication. So it's, it's two sides of, of a coin. On one side, it's what people are seeing. So obviously, if your body language, you are contracted, you are slumping, right. looking down, people yeah. instinctively might think, you know, there's something, there's something wrong, or you're not mm. sending the the right signals. Mm. But do you know that you also reinforce in yourself? Mm. So studies have shown, for example, when you open up your body and you sit up or stand upright, you increase the level of testosterone in your body, which mm. men and women have. Mm and lower cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So mm. you're actually helping yourself be more confident. Yeah. So I've it's, heard it's that, fascinating. Actually. I've yeah. heard that, like right before an interview, if yeah. you're feeling nervous about something, 
consider going into a bathroom, literally doing that, like almost like opening up your arms as wide as possible yeah. and like taking it as like, this yeah. is mine, this is mine. Two minutes of this before you, you go in for an yeah. interview. I think you may have even said that. Was that me? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think it may have been Derek in one of well, the sessions we had. Yeah. Well, we'll really uh, lower those stress hormones and increase the good hormones of testosterone and dopamine and you will then be able to perform better. Okay, yes. okay, so let's talk about um, visual aids, which is something mm -hmm. that communication gurus um, often reference. Mm -hmm when you're, I don't know whether it's in a presentation or just, so how important are visual aids when it comes to communication? So visual aids are, are really important in a professional setting. I always say if you're going to give a presentation and you do have a slide deck or you have a visual aid a presentation, never forget that you are the star of the show by all means. But okay. the visual aid is, is that, it's an aid, it's an accompaniment. Okay. It reinforces the point. Yeah. And um, a lot of times you will find that people will go up and they'll put up uh, PowerPoints that have way too many bullet points. Mm. They should be more visual. Okay. A lot of big pictures. I mean, that's something you see in advertising. You rarely right. see a lot of bullet points, a lot of words. So try to make it as visual and as stimulating as possible without yeah. overwhelming your okay. message. Okay. And it should be relevant, but it's, it's important that you realize that people communicate visually. Yeah. It is harder for them to read all those bullet points and absorb that information mm -hmm. as it is to see a picture mm -hmm. that is relevant to what you're talking about. And then you are the star of the show now explaining that particular visual, yeah. uh, the idea that you have behind it. Does mm -hmm. it make your, your point stronger? And I, I, I mean, I know we often think that in terms of um, a work presentation, but I can also picture, let's say, a, 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 a husband trying to you know, explain to the wife why it's important that, you know, they move, they get into this investment and therefore, you know, he has A, B, C, D, or even a child trying to tell their parent, hey, mom, dad, this is why I should be allowed to go for camp. So you see, A, B, C. So does it make your point stronger if you have some visual aids? You know, it, it helps certainly in a professional sense, but you mentioned an important point. We think visually. If I ask you to think of a newspaper right yeah. now, what comes up is an image of yeah. the newspaper, maybe yeah. a picture on yeah. the newspaper and not necessarily the, 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 the wording. Yeah. And so even when you're trying to explain your ideas, painting a story, mm. making it as visual as it is, sort of um, putting that picture in a mind where somebody can literally picture it mm. is a great way of communicating in all of those scenarios that you pointed out. Okay, yes. okay. So how do you know that your message has been received? Uh, how, do, how do you know that you're um, communicating com and communicating well? Well, part of that is the listening skills. So that's okay another part of great communication yeah. great communicators are great listeners okay, so you have to be mm, you've got to be perceptive on your yeah. audience yeah. you've got to be able to read their body language whether they're absorbing yeah, or taking like, it in yeah right <laughs> well i was just wondering like so if i am in front of an audience and i'm the body language to me reads like like that someone's on their phone how in how do I reverse that? How do I like undo that and try and get their attention back? So in a more formal presentation, and believe you me, I've been doing this for quite a while, so I'm pretty quick on reading the cues that an audience is sending to me. If I seem to have lost them, like you said, they're on their phones. Yeah. They seem a little distracted. One of the great things that great communicators do is do something to involve the audience. You know, ask a question so that they can respond. Uh, have something maybe that you can actually hand out to the audience that they can feel, that they can touch. A formal presentation doesn't just need to be you talking. Yeah. You can bring in not just the visual aids, you can bring in props, you can involve the audience, you can really get them to participate. And part of that is listening to them. And the listening to them is just being aware what cues or clues are they giving off based on their body language mm. or okay. even responses. Yeah, so you, it's not just about being able to communicate, it's also reading mm. how are they are receiving it. So impromptu speeches, mm. okay, let's, that I think for many is like the worst nightmare to just be called up randomly and like give a speech, whether it's at a wedding, at a work meeting, whatever it may be. So h what would be your tips um, in, in a situation where they've been caught off guard but for them to still be able, for someone to still be able to give, uh, to communicate beautifully with the audience, yeah. 
off the cuff speak, yeah. uh, extemporaneous speaking, uh, yeah, one of the hardest things to do because naturally the instinct is, oh, I'm going to embarrass myself, I don't know what to say. Yeah. But you know, one of the things that you should know is that anytime you are put in a situation like that, come up with a story. Storytelling okay. is something that any audience in any culture naturally instinctively responds positively to. So whether you are speaking at your niece's birthday party and you mm. suddenly be asked to oh, can, can stand up and say something, think of a story that involved your niece or the family. You're asked to speak in church, for example, um, say a prayer, mm. involve some sort of story. And a story can be an anecdote, it mm. can be a personal experience, it can be a place that you have traveled, someone who has affected you. All of us have stories because when we're one on one and we're sitting and we're having lunch, it's all about stories. I yeah. tell you a story, you tell me a story. So think the same way and just know that you're obviously uh, broadcasting it to a larger audience yeah. when you're asked to stand up and speak. Just think of a story. And that's the, I think in my mind, the best advice for being story. able to speak right. off the cuff. Right. And would you say that getting the audience to laugh is like has to be one of the things that you do besides getting your point across is it important that you get them to laugh at some point so uh we are emotional human beings mm -hmm. uh, last time i here i spoke about emotional intelligence yeah. and one of the things that we respond to is humor okay now not everybody can be a stand-up comedian but if you can involve humor in your formal communication at a presentation during an interview that only serves to connect you with your audience more because audiences will naturally respond to that. Okay. But that doesn't mean that you go onto the internet and look for recycled jokes because humor can be subtle, humor can be dark. There's yeah. all types of humor. It doesn't have to be laugh out, stand up comedy yeah. type of humor. But if you have a little bit of humor, that only makes you a more effective and in my mind, a better communicator. Yeah, right. Because people let their guards down, right? Sure. And you're able to like connect a little bit easier. So so how do I then also get the message to stick? How do I get for retention to be to be a thing? Yeah. You know, in, in, when I'm communicating to someone, how do I know that it's stuck? Stickability. One yeah. of the things I talk about is something called the power of three. Okay. It's repetition. If you can repeat a point three times, if you can say the same thing three times in a different way, but okay. still making the same point, yeah. that repetition and using three, which yeah. is a magic number, that's just something that our brains automatically look for. It's a rhythm that our brains are hardwired to be able to retain information. Yeah. So particularly in the more formal type of presentations or communication, yeah. if you can look for a way to do and introduce this three, repeating a point three times, um, maybe even breaking down your points into three themes or three oh, categories. Okay. That usually is the magic source to have uh, a point stay, okay. stick. Okay, so mm -hmm. can you give me an example of mm -hmm. how you would do that without mm -hmm. sounding like a broken toe? Some of the greatest communicators in the world have used this. Um, let's look at former President Obama. Okay. He would, for example, talk in his speech, we will work for it. We will fight for it. We will earn it. It. What is that it? Uh, but he said that it three digit times. He said we will work for it. We will fight for it. We will earn it. Okay. And that it was we will earn the votes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can... It's been used in so many different things. Okay. Uh, in real estate, for example, we talk about location, location, location. Okay. The Olympic motto is uh, faster, uh, higher, uh, stronger. It's yeah. not faster, higher, stronger, and then further yeah. again. Yeah. So that rhythm okay. where you sort of couch or repeat phrases or words three times yeah. is a, a great way of communicating to okay. any audience. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about hand gestures. Mm -hmm. You talked about Obama and there's like, an, like you just Presidents have this thing. Um, people in uh, positions of leadership will often have this thing that just is so presidential, is so authorita authoritative. So how important are hand gestures in communicating? So uh, a lot of public figures, presidents are, are coached. 
Ah. And they're coached on their hand gestures. Okay. On hand gestures? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're coached how to use certain hand gestures. If you gesture closer to the heart, for example, the point you're making will strike more of an emotional bond with an audience. So if, <laughs> if I do something like this, yeah. like I, or something like that. Yeah, closer to the heart. Palm down gesture means that we are together. So there are all sorts of things. But what I would say for most people yeah. is that just let your natural hand gestures and natural, because most people will gesture with their hands naturally. Some people do it a little bit more, like yeah. I do, because I know the power of using my hands. And yeah. hands have been so important in the evolution of human history. Yeah. Uh, if you can imagine that we, a million years ago, and we were living in caves, for example, and I came to your cave and I have my hands behind my back, and I came and I requested for brown sugar. Stay with me. I don't know why we'd be doing that a million yeah. years ago. <laughs> And you couldn't see my hands, yeah. and perhaps you said you have no brown sugar. Yeah. Maybe I was hiding a weapon, yeah. and so I'll take it out and stab it. So naturally, being able to see someone's hands has always been in the way our minds and our brains have evolved that this person isn't okay, threatening. Threatening. Okay. And we don't live in caves anymore, right. but our brains still have those reptilian. Mm. Uh, those functions yeah. that are automatic. And that's why hand gestures are really important, important because if you can gesture or gesticulate with your hands when you're making a point like I am doing, yeah. your brain is listening to the words that are coming out of my mouth, but you're also watching my hand gestures and the hand gestures are reinforcing my message. Now I talked about natural hand gestures because yeah. some people don't use their hands a lot and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if you do use your hands, uh, let them be in concert or in conjunction with the words that are coming out of mouth. And then you can realize that certain gestures, like the one that I'm doing, okay, yeah. actually... <laughs> I never do that, so I'm just like practicing sure. so uh, that next time you'll see mm -hmm. me living with this like this, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know what's even, what's even perhaps interesting, uh, even more interesting, is that you can use your hand gestures when you speak, for example, but what about when you're not speaking? What are your hands doing? Have you ever mm. noticed what people are doing? Yeah, exactly. Right. So this is the universal gesture for being closed off in most right. cases. There's yeah. something that we talk about where people have sort of baseline um, uh, nonverbal communication, but generally this means I'm closed off. Yeah, got And it. if you're at a party or if you're at a networking function, this is not necessarily the most inviting for people yeah. to come and talk to you versus yeah. having my hands maybe naturally by yeah. my side. Yeah. Or this one, where people are usually protecting, you know, certain vulnerable areas, shall we say, yeah. this sort of gesture. And you see that Interesting. a lot. Yeah. So being aware of what your hands are doing, not only when you're speaking, okay. but even when you're not speaking, yeah. can it's really revolutionize, in my mind, how you communicate. Okay. <laughs> well, Derek, we have to go on break, but uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> When we come back, we'll talk about the art of persuasion, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back, everybody. We're at Park Inn by Radisson, and we're talking all things communication. And for this next segment, we are diving deep into persuasion. How do you get people to buy into your idea? Um, I've got Derek Banka with me here. So, yeah, how do you get people to buy into your idea? Life is all about persuading people yeah. to buy into your idea. Okay. As children, we're trying to convince our parents to allow us to do this. Yeah. Uh, parents are trying to stop their children from doing something to buy into the idea that you shouldn't touch the fire yeah. and throughout our lives whether you're an entrepreneur whether you're in business whether you're looking for a job whether you're convincing someone to go out for a date with you okay. whether you're with your partner and you're trying to you know ask them to do something life is all about persuasive communication skills so then what is the art of it what, what's at the core of it what are those tips so part of that is for example being able to frame your thoughts or your ideas in a way that makes it easy for people to buy into that particular idea okay so for example let's look at the business world okay okay the professional world as an entrepreneur or looking for a job a lot of people feel that using certain shall we say complicated words yeah. or using jargon, okay. uh, using well worn out cliches, okay. which is an easy way of communicating, but it is not persuasive because it is actually a lazy way of communicating. Okay. So rather than using phrases like, 
I don't know, think outside the box, for example, which is something that people use all the time and it slips off the tongue because it's easy. It's more difficult to persuade somebody to literally think outside the box if you say that. But if you tell them that, listen, let's perhaps approach this um, differently. Let's look for a new idea of how we can, you know, sell this particular product and saying exactly what you mean. That to me is being more persuasive than, for example, using cliches and jargon. So key, w number one, make sure you're communicating effectively, yeah, very it's clearly. Keep, it's, it's, it's the rule of, of KISS, okay. you know, keep, keep, it, keep it simple to okay. a certain extent. Uh, the greatest communicators are always been able, people who've been able to take complex ideas and been able to distill them in a way that doesn't dumb down that knowledge, but still allows that particular idea to be made crystal clear in the mind of the person that okay. they're trying to persuade. So a way of communicating simply. Now that could even be, as I said, not using cliches, it could be using simpler English. Again, you've got to study your audience. If I am a scientist presenting my white paper at a scientific uh, conference with my peers in the scientific community, it makes sense for me to use that type of language. But even in a case like that, where you have maybe 15 minutes to communicate your idea, Perhaps simplifying that idea makes it easy for an audience to understand. The brain is looking for the easiest way yeah. to be persuaded. It's like milk or water that spills on the floor over here. It's looking for the easiest path to travel. The brain is looking for easy ways to be able to make that information. And if you make it difficult, or if okay. the brain now starts, ha starts having to work harder, yeah. then you're less likely to persuade that person or have them buy into your idea. Okay, so simplicity mm -hmm. in communication. Yes. Is there another like uh, pillar when it comes to the art of persuasion? I wouldn't call them a pillar. I okay. mean, these are generally tips, for yeah. example, and I'm still on language. Okay. So for example, certain words mm -hmm. that sometimes take away from uh, maybe the strength of a particular statement. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a a word, and I'll keep it in context here in Kenya, that people use. And you ask them, what is your name? And they'll say, well, basically, I'm called so-and-so. And, -so. and okay. you ask them, what do you do for a living? And basically, yeah. that word basically. Yeah. Those are words that you now need to start minimizing in your vocabulary. Because a word like that basically takes away from the power of that statement, which is, this is what I do for a living, or this is my name. And people don't think about that because we speak yeah. the way that we are used to speaking. That's right. what people say. Yeah. So using certain words, for example, okay. makes it difficult for you to persuade other people okay. and to buy into your idea. And that's just one word that I would encourage yeah. all Kenyans to do. And yeah. <laughs> minimize the word basically. Somebody asks you what your name is, just say, my name is Derek, rather yeah. than, well, basically, Right. My name is Derek. Right. Mm -hmm. In a world where everyone is trying to sell you something, right? Whether it's leaders or brands or suitors as well, that you know you're you're getting a lot of people uh, trying to come at you and and be like, hey, pick me, pick me. I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the simplest way is the easiest way because I feel like we're bombarded with so much that we end up looking for the most exciting thing. Or so so then how? How do you stand out in the way you persuade, in the way that you, uh, you get someone's attention and you get them to do what you're saying, mm -hmm. given that there's, there's just constantly so much going? Mm -hmm. um, how do you stand out? Okay, I mentioned this in passing in the previous segment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was, uh, for example, and we're talking about the sort of verbal communication, because you can stand out with the way that you dress, you can stand out through your image, that for sure might get your foot in the door but then when you have to open your mouth uh, to speak mm. storytelling is okay. the art of persuasion right. right there being able to put your ideas to put your thoughts to talk to somebody and create this visual image in their mind or in their brain mm -hmm. and you can do that simply with stories. And stories, okay. as I said, come from experiences, they come from anecdotes, they okay. can come from all sorts of things. Okay. And it's as simple as 20 seconds of me telling you what happened to me on the way to the hotel. Mm. And I've already been able, I've already created that sort of uh, emotional link mm. 
which now makes it easier for me to say, well, now this is why I want you to believe me, right. or this is what I want you to do. Okay. So bookending your thoughts and your ideas with stories is a fantastic way of being Memorable. persuasive. Yeah, and, and persu mm -hmm. persuasive. What about moments in which you're not physically present to persuade someone? And I'll give you an example. It could be a brand and their product is on the shelf. Um, it could be uh, an email sent out and I'm, so, I'm not able to really be there to articulate as perfectly as I'd like to. Um, but I'm still communicating with the audience in, in some way. So when I don't have this, my dress, what I look, how I sound, um, how do I still persuade you to buy my product, to buy into my um, project if it's an email that I've sent you to some venture capitalist? How do I, how do I, how do, I do that? Okay, so we're talking a little bit about digital communication, for yeah. example. So whether it's on email or maybe some other social media platform. Mm -hmm. Well, again, some of the things we've talked about apply, keeping it simple, not literally boring people mm. with a lot of words, being as visual as you can within that medium. If it does allow you to do that, the best brands are the brands that sort of are iconic in terms of what we imagine them to be. Mm. And visually, it could be through an ad, it could be how the brand looks, it could be the colors that are used. Everything sort of comes down to being able to paint a particular visual image in the mind. Now, digital communication, if you're writing an email, I would say keep it simple, try to be as you know, professional as possible, using whatever etiquette requ is required for that particular medium. To me, that would be the most effective way of communicating through, uh, say, email. Okay. For example, email. Mm -hmm. um, and what about like brands on a shelf? How do they stand out? How do they persuade? It, yeah. yeah. So there's something called the psychology of color, for okay. example. Okay. And certain colors communicate certain things. For example, this wonderful blue you're wearing mm. communicates trust. It communicates. Yes. Does it really? Yeah, it does. Okay. Is, uh, that's why it's the most popular color in business, because it's it sort of signifies trustworthiness. Mm. It sort of signifies that you can take my word and um, as opposed to for example red which red is perhaps a little bit more passion. yeah maybe passion yeah. maybe a little bit more uh, uh, confident a little bit okay. more power, power yeah. uh, green maybe is a color that's uh, sort of a little more calm yeah, a little brown. more inviting mm -hmm. yellow is the color that travels the quickest on the the color spectrum so if you okay. want to stand out uh, that's why the lane markings are, are yellow, so that you can see them when you're in a m vehicle that's, that's moving. Yeah. You know, if you're speaking to a huge audience of a thousand people, I'd say have something yellow, for example, on you, so that people can sort of focus on you. Or if you're a product that's on a shelf with thousands of other similar products, mm -hmm. have, a, you know, a, a yellow color there or an orange. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of those colors that would stand out as opposed to obviously colors that would be darker. So that's how a brand okay. would stand out, uh, you know, it's, okay. uh, it's how they use the colors. And yeah. there are many companies and brands that are using that yeah. to, to stand out. And mm -hmm. everything matters, colors, mm -hmm. fonts, uh, text, I guess everything is also still part of communication, sure. especially for a brand and a product. So emotions, is that one way to persuade someone? And I mean that in the sense, if I was here saying, Derek, I really need 5,000 shillings. And then I started to cry. Or perhaps I tried to get you to see why I need it because I'm in desperate need. My XYZ mom or something needs it. That emotional connection, whichever way you look at it, whether it's through tears or through, can you see me in, in, in this conversation? Can you, can you really see me? Is that, is that, um, cheeky of someone or is that smart of someone and strategic of them to no, no, use an emotional perspective? We've talked about this before. People respond to emotions so long as you're being authentic. Mm. So one of the things, for example, that I would use is that power of three. I would say, you know, I really like 5,000 shillings. Mm -hmm. I really need 5,000 shillings. Mm. I really want 5,000 shillings. So just that simple rephrasing that in a power of three has already created more of an impact with you in terms of my communication mm -hmm. rather than saying I want 5,000 shillings. Mm -hmm. That's number one. But number two, sure, 
The authentic person who really wants, needs and likes the 5,000 shillings, you would see it in their non-verbal communication, how they would use their gestures, you'd see it in their face. And yes, there would be that use of emotional intelligence, being aware of the other person to be able to really persuade them that they would need that money. So it would be using all facets of okay. your communication skills if you really wanted that 5,000 yeah. shillings. Okay. You can take a simple word like hello. Okay. I can say hello. Yeah. I can say hello. Yeah. I can say hello. Yeah. I can say it in a myriad of different ways. And that one word can be interpreted a thousand different ways okay. based on my tone of voice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's about being able to use the appropriate for example, in that case, tone of voice, yeah. to be able to create that emotion in the person who is listening to that particular word okay. or sound. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's important for me as a communicator to make sure whatever my goals are in some way aligned with your individual goals, if I am trying to persuade you? Is that important? So there's awareness of other people and my awareness of you is an awareness of your mood, a mood of awareness of emotions, awareness of your body language. And so I'm able to effectively communicate to you. If I see that you're a little bit perhaps uh, upset today or not yourself, I might even choose not to bring up that particular topic or that particular subject, or I might approach it in a different way because I'm aware that you perhaps are not yourself. Absolutely. But about myself as well is being true to my values and authenticity is being the best version of yourself and the best version of yourself would take everything into account as I am talking to a particular person. So the best version of myself, me, Derek Banger, yeah. is to effectively use my gestures, is to effectively use the tone of my voice, is to effectively be aware of the mood of that particular person and match, for example, my rate of speaking, how fast I am. So for example, during this interview, yeah. I'm talking a little faster than I usually do, but that's because you speak a little faster as well. And the way for me to create rapport with you is to match my rate of speaking. Right. I'm, yeah, I'm literally doing it. Really? Yes, really. Oh, so. and, but when you slow down, I also slow down. And you don't necessarily notice it consciously, and I'm giving away a trade secret, yeah. but I listen to how you ask me a question, and my response matches everything. I'm even doing a little bit of reciprocity in body language. So really? when you lean forward, I'm leaning forward. When you do your hands like this, I'm doing this. I'm, I mean, I'm not mimicking, but there's a little bit of that reciprocity because I want to connect with you and my connection with you is to be able for me to do these things which make you say, hey, you know, that's, that's a great guest and I actually like having him. What? <laughs> so, those are things Derek's that been playing me. I, no, I'm not playing you no. this many times. He's been reading me. <laughs> That's why I'm on to you, Mr. <laughs> just no. I'm not like, no, I'm kidding. I'm just messing. No, I love it. Yeah. I, and I love that. So that's what you can do. Just yeah. be aware yeah. as well. Like, and you're reading and it, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's going to push a lot more people to just be a little bit more conscious of mm -hmm. the other person. Um, because again, I really do think you're a great guest on the well, show. And now I'm like, I, this is part of it. This is part of it. Feeling like there, I can understand you. I can get, can connect with what you're saying. I get it. This is genius. And you're going to get everything you want. Derek has the secrets. And maybe the one final thing I can say about this yeah. is take your ego out of the equation. It's okay. not about you. If you want to be a great communicator, it's always about the other person. It's always about the audience. It's always about what would make that person respond to me effectively and not necessarily well i want this person to buy my idea i want them to buy my product i want them to buy into me no it's actually well what does this person like yeah. and that removes your ego out of the way thank you Derek. <laughs> and thank you for like giving away the trade seat because i am now like it, it it just it makes so much sense and it's not just by chance you know it's not just that you're knowledgeable. It's again, there's a something there. Now I get it. It's because you're, it's like a dance almost and you get it. That's one way of explaining that it. Yeah, for sure. All right. Now with that said, I'm going to outro part two and um, try and use my hand gestures to make sure that you really understand that you need to come back after the break 
because we're going to talk about public speaking. So we'll be back in a moment. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, everybody. We've been talking about communication with Derek here. And, um, and now we're going to speak about public speaking, right. which is a lot of people's worst nightmares, oh. mine included. Yes. I have something coming up that I am dre I tried to get myself out of it, but I, I can't. Um, so I'm really asking not just um, because I think people are curious, but because I also personally have an interest and I want to learn. Um, first question is, do you think someone can effectively avoid or pro avoid public speaking for the rest of their lives, like to not to not be able to stand or to not be able to have to stand in front of people. Is that something that someone can avoid? Let me put it this way. Yeah. It is everybody's destiny, everybody's destiny okay. to one day stand up and speak in front of an audience. Okay. That audience might be five, yeah. might be 500, it might be 5,000. Okay. But someday you are going to do it. Right. And if by chance, you never get to speak in front of an audience yeah. at all yeah. in your life, yeah. I would say that you have never achieved why you were put mm. on this earth. In other words, what I'm saying is that I talk about a lot of skills. To me, public speaking ranks up there. I don't even call it a soft skill anymore. Oh. I call it a fundamental skill. Oh. Because even what you learn in formal public speaking can be used in one-on-one -on -one communication. Okay. It literally is a must-have in your portfolio wow. of skills if you want to become the best version of you mm. today. Mm. So whether that's in a classroom, yes. a church, a uh, work meeting, village uh, or community, like neighborhood meeting, you're probably at some point going to stand whether in front of an audience. Whether it's in the village, speak. Mashinani, yeah. whether it's in a nice fancy hotel like yeah. this, yeah church, birthday party, wedding, at some point, somebody's going to say, can you stand up and say something? Eee, already, and even just you saying <laughs> that, like, I'm like, oh. yeah. how do you, how, how do you stand up and not throw up? How do you do, how do you stand up in front of people and, and communicate, especially when you have all the nerves okay. and, and all of that? How do you get rid of that? So first of all, as much as I've said it's a destiny and something that you need to sort of have as a skill, yeah. put it into perspective. What is the worst that can happen? You stand up and you fumble mm -hmm. and you sit down. Mm -hmm. People's lives continue. They don't even, it doesn't even register. So if you put it in perspective in terms of things that can go wrong in your life, public speaking, if it goes wrong, really ranks at the bottom. But if you get it right, it's amazing. It opens mm. up doors, people ask you to do it again. It's wonderful for your brand. Mm. So put it into perspective. That nervousness that you're feeling, by the way, is something that all public speakers feel. I don't care whether you are Donald Trump okay. or you're Derek Banger yeah. or you're Sharon Mandia. At some point, you do feel a little bit nervous because it's a human condition to want right. to impress people, right. not to want to make a fool of yourself. Yeah. But because everybody suffers from that condition, your audience also recognizes that. And so their expectations are not going to be that high mm. because they know what it's like. And if you, if, if you can quantify it, let's say it was 10% of a speech, okay? 10% okay? is nervousness. That 10%, most people do not even notice it. You notice it yourself. They don't notice your sweaty, you know, your sweaty armpits. No, they don't. I mean, unless you have a gigantic, okay. massive... Okay. But if, yeah. you're, if your hands are down here, most yeah. people will not notice it. Okay. If you're shaking a little bit, yeah. most people don't. Most unless people. it's literally you're holding yeah. a piece of paper. Most people do not notice that. They may notice one or two signs. Okay. But again, people sort of expect that yeah. because everybody has been okay. in that position. Okay, and uh, I guess that's a good one. Mm -hmm. To know that people are already going to be gentle mm -hmm. because they understand that it's a nerve-wracking thing anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's like, let's just, you know, it's, it's, it's understandable. I mean, most people will not judge us that harshly when it comes to delivery. And I have to say this, because the bar is generally set so low, people's expectations are right there. Okay. It's like, why should somebody come up and move us? Why should come, somebody come up and speak and the hairs on the back of our neck stand up? Because that happens so infrequently. Mm. Most people are used to the general speech. You get up, 
you clap politely, okay. you say a few words, you sit down and life goes on. Right. I guess, and that's the pressure we put on ourselves. We think this ought to be the speech that changes your life forever. This is the Oprah speech that will stick with you throughout your life. But really, all yeah. you need to do is just like own your truth in that moment and just share what you have to share. Yeah, and in fact, let me just say, if yeah. there, there are three speeches you will always give anytime you get up to speak. There's okay. the one that you prepare, if you do prepare, mm -hmm. which again, not most people do. Then there's the one that you deliver. Mm -hmm. And then there's the one that you wish that you gave. Okay. And everybody, even the most seasoned veteran speakers, will always go back and it's human nature to be critical and say, oh, I forgot to say that, I wish I had done this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So every time you get up and speak, you sort of improve and okay. do a little better next time. Okay. Right. So let's talk about the prep work. Yes. How, I mean, I've heard of things like, you know, what you should do and then when you stand there just imagine everyone is naked and it's like I don't think that ever works and also who wants to imagine a, a, a naked audience I don't know about you that wouldn't work for me so yeah. so other thing <laughs> are there like things you could do that will help prep you for for that moment when you're standing up and having to give that speech? and that's a great question first of all please don't don't imagine your audience naked no that's Does not that a good that's work? not a good thing yeah. I don't even know but there's all kind of weird advice out there yeah. But preparation is definitely solid advice. And the great speakers, you look at them and you're like, wow, this person, they're so natural at it. Mm. No, they're not natural. Mm. This person prepared. Believe you me. There's stories that are told of the legendary Steve Jobs, who mm. was a, an icon mm. when it came to public speaking. Mm. And he literally prepared for days to deliver a one hour presentation. Mm. We may not have that time, but you certainly do have the time to prepare, even a little bit. Okay. Now, what goes in that preparation depends on how formal yeah. or informal the speech is. Mm -hmm. So if you're giving a more formal speech, one of my suggestions would be to at least practice it at the very least yes. three times. Now, okay. you can practice it in front of somebody who can yeah. give you some feedback. Yeah. And yes, you can practice it in front of a mirror, but that's really not going to tell you much other than the fact that you are rehearsing mm. what you are going to say. You're kind of refining your ideas, how you're going to present them. You might need to shorten your speech mm. or your presentation, which most people need to do. If you have uh, slides, for example, you might decide to work on those a little bit. But you can't go up on stage and be delivering it for the first time tomorrow. So you've got to prepare. Preparation is the key to confidence, and confidence is definitely the key to success. What happens if you end up fumbling? If you make a mistake, uh, say the wrong word, say, say the wrong thing, how do you pick yourself up from that in that moment? Yeah, that happens to the best of us. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that has happened to me. You say the wrong word, you forget what to say. Again, you're a human being. Mm. Just take a deep breath, mm. calm yourself down, mm. remove the fleeting thoughts that are in your mind and just pick up where you left off. And okay. by the way, don't make a big deal of it. So some of us have a tendency to apologize and you apologize for things that really don't, you don't need to apologize for. Okay. Just get on with it. People are not there to listen to your apology if you, okay. you know, if you, if you misspoke or if you said the wrong, the wrong word. I mean, yeah. unless you say something that's completely off the wall. Yeah. Um, I give an example of, um, I think it's the Indian president, not okay. the Prime Minister. Indian president was giving a speech to the United Nations. Uh -huh. Okay, so huge audience. Yeah. Starts reading his speech, yeah. three minutes into his presentation, yeah. his aides can be seen running from behind him okay. because he's reading the entirely wrong speech. He's supposed to be delivering a speech on water and he's delivering a speech on security. So obviously he had not prepared, he didn't know, he was just given his speech and told, go ahead and speak. So his aides came, they shuffled his papers, obviously gave him the right speech. And without batting an eyelid, he just continued speaking where it took off. Now, in a case like that, you might want to tell the audience, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I gave the wrong speech. So that story just illustrates that oh, there is... Wow. Even the, first of all, even yeah. the best of us can make things, mistakes. Things happen. Yeah, things happen. But um, don't, don't dwell on, on, on 
minor errors that you might make during a speech. People mm. are willing you to go on mm. and just get on with it. Mm. Yes. Are there any tips on like, should you be reading or should you be like more connecting with people? Yeah. Um, and I think the pressure in this day and age is that we have, we have all these amazing speeches coming out from like award shows and they're the ones that, you know, like the iconic Lupita Nyong'o, our dreams are valid, you know, and, and like Oprah Winfrey's speech as well the other day. It looks like it just came from their heart and it's now out here and it's completely stuck. So, so what, what's the balance between letting it come out from, you know, your heart and just letting that, that take, take charge um, and also, you know, sit, sticking to your notes and just reading what's out there, okay. what's lined out, yeah. It's a balance. We speak from the heart to the heart. Now, the more formal speech that you may have prepared notes and you want to make sure because it's a policy speech, it may be a mm. speech in a political arena, for example, and you don't want to miss anything out, mm. you're sort of stuck with the delivering, but you can still bring in elements of a performance. Mm -hmm where now perhaps you are able to do a little bit of riffing, speaking off the cuff, even though you're within the parameter of the prepared notes. Mm. But I also like to say that even with prepared notes, there's still elements that you can do that don't need the notes. You don't need the notes to introduce yourself to an audience. Mm. That's you authentically speaking, giving your story, yeah. your background, giving an anecdote. You can do that at the beginning of the speech. You can do that at the end of the speech and you can certainly weave it in between. Now for the great speakers that you've mentioned who are able to make it seem like they are just speaking authentically off the cuff, I can honestly tell you they have prepared that but you prepare it in such a way that even when you deliver it it looks like you are just literally speaking yeah, you just like woke up and speak out of bed it. and like yeah. said this amazing powerful exactly speech. obama would deliver speeches like that how many people know that obama read 99 percent of his speeches but he looked like he was just speaking okay. literally from the heart but he was reading from a teleprompter mm. which is what we do in the news business right, right. yeah but the teleprompters were there and he practiced the speech in such yeah. a way that even when he was giving a story of him getting yeah. into a car from the airport and going all the way to his homeland and seemed like just a story that he was giving off the cuff. That speech was written down and he prepared and practiced and rehearsed mm. so that when he delivered it, he delivered it like he was telling that story for the first time and people ate it up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So A, teleprompters are your friend, if you have if one. If you have one. <laughs> and B, practice, practice. Yes. But even if you do have your notes, it still comes out of you in a very natural, organic way. Um, what are some common mistakes people make, would you say? I mean, I know we've touched on, well, not really the mistakes, but if you don't practice, I imagine it's not going to come out so naturally. Um, but are there other things that people do that sort of... Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily call them mistakes, okay. but I think they're areas that a lot of us can improve. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, the beginning of, oh. a, of a speech. Okay. Uh, for me, speeches and presentations are one at the beginning, yeah. they're also one at the end. Okay. So, nail that intro. Okay. And whether it's coming up with a story, okay. coming up with something interesting, something humorous, sort of get people on your side. It even helps, if you're nervous, to sort of act as an icebreaker. Mm. And rather than be a little bit more formal, that's maybe the one area of a speech that you can be as informal as the occasion allows, is the beginning of a speech. A great intro to a speech usually indicates that people are going to pay attention okay. and win it. So nail your intro. Yeah, nail your, your intro. Out, and the end. The right. Outro. And then when you come to the end, yeah. again, end positively, end upbeat. Your voice okay. should end upbeat. Okay. Your energy should should end up most of us end our speeches like this and thank you yeah. for listening to me <laughs> okay that's, that's <laughs> perhaps not the most effective way okay. to end a speech so end it upbeat end with a great quote end with a great story end with something again that creates that connection so even if you lost them in the middle you made a few mistakes you can bring them back with a great finish okay got it I think that's great. That, that's a good sum up of what to do, what not to do, um, and what to focus on. Thank you so much, Derek. It's always such a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we're going to have you again soon. Now that I know your tricks, now that I know what you've been doing, you're probably going to see him over and over again.
All right. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned something new. If you have a speech to give, good luck. Okay. And now you know what to do. And if you've been struggling with communication, then I guess now you know what you need to be a little bit more aware of next time you're speaking to an audience or to just even, even if just that audience is just one person. Mm -hmm. Now you know. Thanks, everybody. And thank you to Parkin by Radisson. We'll be back 8 a.m. tomorrow. Bye, everybody.